Hello, uh, my name is Pat Young and uh, welcome to the CMC debate. Uh, I am the managing director of an independent production company called Cardiff Productions and I'm also the chair of the British Broadcasting Challenge, an organisation which has been set up to push for the biggest and broadest debate around the future of PSB and an end to the secrecy surrounding its future. Now, today's session has been produced by the Children's Media Foundation, which is an advocacy body that campaigns for the best possible media choices for UK kids and teenagers. It's associated with the launch today, right now, in fact, of their major report on the future of public service media for young people. The report is a multi-layered and multi-authored exploration of why we need public service media, especially when thinking about young audiences. It, stress, it looks at the stresses on the current system, most obviously the flight to non-PSB platforms, as well as the agendas in government, the possible solution to the challenges, and what sort of future framework would allow public service media to continue to remain relevant and watched. You will find a digital copy of the report in your online delegate badge uh, bag, and if you haven't looked there, there's also a free copy of the other Children's Media Foundation publication, the Children's Media Yearbook. <clears throat> the Children's Media Foundation report is a, in part a response to Ofcom, the DCMS, and various parliamentary select committees are all looking into the future of public service media, but hardly any reference at all to young people. So the report is designed to redress that imbalance and in particular to introduce more future-focused radical thinking as to how uh, such emerging technologies, platforms and audience habits will impact a new public service media framework. The CMF believes that if policymakers spent more time looking at what's happening in, in the children's media sector, they would actually be better placed to plan for those changes. So this is a report in part on what public service content means for the TikTok, Fortnite and Roblox generation. It heads off to regulators and politicians today and I can recommend it as a thoroughly stimulating read. In the conference itself, I would also suggest watching one of the videos in the research strand, Empowering Generation Z. It's a pull together of various research studies made by, international, by an international academic alliance, the Youth Media and Culture Network, also dedicated to understanding public service media and the younger audiences. <clears throat> At the end of this debate, there will be a chance to meet some of the people involved uh, in the session and the CMF report in Wonder. So please make your way there to continue the discussion. And the lunchtime get together in Wonder from one until two will be hosted by Esther Kaufman and friends with a special focus on writers, meeting producers, agents, and so on. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I should mention the sponsor for this session, they are my fellow Welsh media company, Boom Kids. They've got skin in the game today, in a way, as they have two young audience content fund projects airing this year. Meet the experts on Milkshake and The Secret on S4C. And so they send a big diokon vow to the fund and we send a huge thank you back to them. Now, we've had two slight changes to the advertised program. Unfortunately, Patricia Hidalgo has sent her apologies and can't be with us today. And also Lord Vasey's availability has been cut because of his work commitments in the House of Lords. And so we're gonna hear from Ed Vasey first before we go to the rest of our panel. So Ed, uh, good to see you again. Uh, have Hello. You recovered from last night? Have you recovered from last night? Just about, I've got a bit of a sore voice. Sore voices that I've got a sore head. Um, Ed, <laughs> our time with you is limited, so I'm going to uh, jump straight in. Um, Ofcom are about to make recommendations to government on the future of public service media. What do you think needs to be in those recommendations to make sure we can create positive media experiences for children and young people? Well, I think it's a, it's a wide and complex landscape, and uh, I think it's important to critique what we mean by public service media. So I think that a clear definition of the role of public service broadcasting or public service media 
in the 21st century is important. I'm fond of saying, for example, that some of the uh, non-public service broadcasters are perfectly entitled to say that they are they provide public service broadcasting, whether that's Sky or Netflix or Disney Plus even. Uh, but I suspect for me, uh, the role of public service broadcasting is pretty clear. It's a commitment to children's programming as well as news. And it's also a commitment to what I would loosely define as British cultural content. And once you've defined it, then I think, uh, and one shouldn't lose sight, by the way, of radio and of course now we have to really start thinking not just about on-demand broadcasting but also social media as well uh, but that's not perhaps for now secondly i think it's pretty clear that um the uh biggest regulatory intervention is likely to be prominence on smart screens so i'm sure most of the people watching this now have one of those flash flat screen televisions where the apps appear at the bottom of the screen and you almost use them as uh, channels in the way you and I, Pat, as children used to flick between BBC One and BBC Two. We now flick between uh, Netflix and the iPlayer. Uh, so I think that'll be the second thing. And I think the third thing is clearly for the public service broadcasters, whether that's the BBC or ITV or Channel Four or Five, you know, what are the benefits that they get from signing up to these uh, conditions? And then I think you use the term public service media. I think the intervention of the Young Audience Content Fund is very interesting. I, I originally opposed it when I was a minister, partly because I thought the BBC gets enough stick uh, if you create another, even though it's very small, another fund that will cause uh, more controversy. But actually, it's been it's attracted no controversy at all, as far as I'm aware. And it's also seen as a very highly successful fund. Uh, and it may be that we move as well towards thinking about how you fund content rather than direct all the regulation as it were at the platforms so you, you talk about the young audiences content fund currently funded by a bbc top slice uh bbc's lost 30 percent of its money in the last uh, 50, uh 11 years um if you see an expansion in the in the content fund should that come from the bbc or should that come from other places well, I was thinking about this uh, earlier because obviously in my contribution to the uh, Children's Media Conference publication, I talk about a potential sort of cultural levy. Uh, and I've talked about that as well in other arenas. Uh, you know, the uh, Design and Artist Copyright Society is also starting a campaign for a smart fund with a levy on <clears throat> devices. And I've talked elsewhere about the possibility of a tourist tax to fund cultural institutions. Uh, at the moment, we have two big cultural taxes. One is paid compulsory, that's the license fee. The other is paid voluntarily, and that's the lottery, which is effectively uh, a cultural fund. Most of it is, is, broadly speaking, a cultural fund in the sense it goes to heritage uh, and the arts. Other parts go to sport and communities, but it's a big intervention. Um, so one has to be careful when one proposes new taxes. And I'm a person who naturally is a conservative. I favor both low taxes and simple taxes. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that there is a, uh, a debate to be had about sort of transactional taxes in the sense that people often buy devices because they want to watch great content on it. And the content they watch is not making any contribution to our sort of cultural ecology. Uh, and they come and visit London because they want to visit our great cultural institutions. And the institutions that benefit from that aren't necessarily making contributions. So there is a debate to be had about some kind of transactional uh, levy. But I think part of the theme of this discussion might be, you know, in terms of politicians' mindset, how you get from A to B. I don't think those are imminent, and I think they would be controversial, but I don't think there's any harm in having that kind of a debate. That, that, I mean, that is really interesting. At the moment, content fund money can't be spent on the BBC. If you were to widen up the funding sources of the content fund, should the BBC still be outside of it or should the BBC be a place as a producer? And I have a degree of self-interest in this question. I'll declare it now. Um, could the content fund fund the projects that could go on on the BBC? Uh, well, that's a pretty technical point. I mean, I think the, the, the politician's argument would be the BBC gets generous funding from the licence fee, which is paid compulsory by most of the households of Britain. So to to provide additional financial support from another source would probably, uh, the other potential benefit fisheries would probably cry uh, foul. And also the content the BBC makes 
even if it's public service content and children's content can also be sold abroad by uh, BBC Studios and others. Uh, so uh, there are plenty of other ways for the BBC, as it were, to recoup its investment in public service broadcasting without perhaps tapping a fund that's designed to support public service content on other platforms. Okay. Now, we think of public service media as a safe space for children. Um, and we we know that uh, Oliver Dowden has talked about the regulation of the of the other platforms. How important is that, do you think, to get this ecology right? Well, there's a whole plethora of regulation coming down the track, and it, and it needs, to a certain extent, to be joined up and to have a sort of clearer narrative. You've got already the age-appropriate design code, which has, I think, already had an impact on platforms like TikTok, for example. And thinking about TikTok, by the way, and you talk about public service broadcasting, you know, I've been reading in the papers, although I haven't seen it myself because I'm not a TikTok user, this concept of book talk, which is where people promote books uh, using TikTok, which apparently had a, a big impact on bookstores, for example. Um, so uh, I can see that, um, uh, you know, you've got the age appropriate design uh, uh, code, and then you've now got obviously the online uh, safety bill coming down the line, which is going to regulate platforms and will have a focus on children as well. And people like B-Ban Kidron in the House of Lords are really leading the charge on this. So you've got these two big chunks of regulation where children are at the center. And uh, I think more and more we are thinking about making sure that there is this concept of the screen, uh, however you use it, and to be blunt with you, most of our kids are using the phone uh, yeah. to make try and make that as safe as possible for children. And the debate could go in almost endless directions. I mean, you could have a debate about anonymity and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, a safe space for children on a screen, an interactive screen, is a very different thing from a safe space for children on a television screen because it's interactive. So suddenly you've got concepts of bullying and, and so on and so forth uh, that you wouldn't have had you know, 10 years before. Yeah. Final question, because I know you, you have to leave us shortly. Um, our PSB system, our PSM system is an ecosystem, and clearly the big event at the moment, the big argument is around the privatisation of Channel 4. Any thoughts on what that could do to this ecology? So uh, uh, Maggie Brown wrote a history of Channel 4, and she gleefully tweeted a quote that I gave her when I was very demob happy having been a minister saying, uh, you know, when John Whittingdale first looked at privatization, you know, I was very open to the idea because I see it as a bit like I was talking earlier about possible taxes to support cultural industries. There's nothing wrong with putting an idea out there. And with privatization, it allows you to look under the bonnet. There's nothing wrong with coming back to something like Channel 4 that's been around since 1982 and constantly asking, is this the right model? Uh, I appreciate there's a fine line between having a, looking under the bonnet and keeping uh, the car permanently sort of uh, doing handbrake turns in the car park. Um, so I, I don't think people should be fearful of this debate if their arguments are robust. I was pleasantly surprised by the consultation document. I thought it was intelligent and clear sighted and put forward some compelling arguments. Now, if you believe that the current ownership model of Channel 4 is the right one, my argument is don't say this is the evil Tories bent on making a quick buck. Marshal your arguments and say why you think the current model of ownership is the mo mo more robust one. And there are two fairly obvious arguments. One is support for the independent production sector. But the consultation document to a certain extent takes that on because a multi-screen, uh, a multi-platform world provides independent producers with many more outlets. Um, uh, and also the fact that, you know, who would acquire Channel 4 and what, what what would that mean? Why would that move the dial in terms of what Channel 4 provides in terms of British, what I would say, British cultural content? That for me is the core argument. So I think people need to marshal their arguments and be robust about them rather than say, take a sort of defensive position and say, oh, this is a terrible government doing a terrible thing. Uh, this is a challenge. It's a challenge to refresh the arguments and it may lead to some long overdue changes at Channel 4, which don't necessarily mean privatization. I think the government's agenda is pretty clear, but this is a consultation. It has to get through Parliament. So people have lots of opportunities to uh, move the debate in their direction. So you're saying stand up and make the case? Yeah, in a very long-winded way. Ed, 
<laughs> no, no, uh, very, very eloquently as always, Ed. Thank you for your time because I know you have to rush on to another uh, parliamentary so much, business. Matt. But thank you, and thank you for the insight. Take care. Thank you. So, uh, the intervention there from Lord Vasey, Ed Vasey, uh, thought provoking and things for you to pick up in your questions. Please keep sending your questions through. I'm now going to introduce our panelists, our debate panelists. We have uh, Jaffet As Asher, a former head of digital for CBBC and now the director of Polarity Reversal Limited, where he creates IP for a variety of platforms. We have Jenny Buckland, the CEO of the Australian Children Television Foundation, and someone with significant experience of how we can fight on behalf of the children's audience when faced with a less than supportive policy environment. Uh, we have Emma Scott, who created Beano Studios and recently established Cultivation Partners to advise senior leaders on how to grow their brand businesses. And our first speaker is David Kleeman, uh, SVP of Global Trends for the strategy and research consultancy firm, Dubit. David has a deep understanding of children's media from around the world, but today is going to get us started with some recent research on how the UK children's audience perceive public service media. Uh, before it gets underway, a quick reminder that we do want your involvement in this session, not only with questions for the panel, which you can send in at any time, but also with your votes. Uh, the debate builds on some of the themes explored in the question time on Tuesday, where we heard some radical uh, ideas on the future of PSM and the challenges we face. And our discussion today will touch on three propositions that develop those themes in which you should see in a side panel on your live feed. And at the end of the discussion, we'd like you to either agree or disagree with each of those propositions. Just click to vote. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to David Kleeman for his presentation. Very good. Thank you very much, Pat. And uh, also thanks to the CMC and thanks to the CMF for the report that just came out today and uh, for their for their focus on public service media. This has been of interest to me since the early 2000s when I did a strategic study on the, on the topic for PBS Kids. And a lot of the challenges and the opportunities that we saw even back in 2001, 2002 are still the same as they are now, even if the context is, much, is very much changed. Uh, I, uh, in my piece for the, the CMF document, I talked about public service and public media in the metaverse, which we're headed toward, because if we don't reserve or prioritize public spaces in these, uh, in these emerging immersive spaces, they're always going to be chasing after commercial interests. But today, I'm not going to be talking so much about the metaverse as I am about uh, what we're seeing from actual kids in their use of public service media. I'm going to race through some slides, so please, uh, I'm happy to share them afterwards. Just let me know, and I'm happy to send you the, the deck. I'm going to be relying on two uh, pieces of research for, for this. One is Dubit Trends, which is our company's tracking survey uh, that takes place in the US and the UK every six months, as well as 18 other countries, but I'll rely on, be relying on the UK data today. And then also our virtual avatar-based research facility called the Click Room, where we brought together a round table of UK teens. Let's start with what kids are actually watching, uh, if you look at, at our trends study. Among the UK public service offerings across two to 15 year olds, the BBC's services rise to the fore. You can see that linear kids channels dropped at the start of the pandemic. And we think that's likely because kids had more time. And so rather than going to a linear service, which is easy, it's, it's what they decide to send to you. They instead were saying, I've got a little more time. I'm going to search for what I want on a, a streaming service service. So that would account for a drop in linear. We did find that families were watching BBC One all together. They were, they were spending more family time around the television. This next chart stacks the public service broadcasters major linear channels uh, to create a kind of a cumulative reach among this is just eight to 10 year olds. So this is in that middle childhood group. And you can see the rise and fall of overall use over time. You can see the inflection points here where PSB viewing of linear decreased. 
they are uh, when things la- happened like a when we saw a growth in in use of Netflix and YouTube, the launch of Disney Plus took a chunk out of the PSP use. The launch of Lockdown Learning because they were going from the linear channels to the the um, uh, bite size and, and lockdown learning services, and also population lockdowns also led to uh, to changes in, in how people were viewing it, uh, public service broadcasters. So now I'm going to switch to what we saw in our click room interviews. The groups were the group was small, but we made it as diverse geographically, ethnically, racially as as possible. We began we we started by asking the kids unprompted what public service media do you use to see how they define it now now remember and and lord vesey kind of referred to this for today's kids everything competes with everything they don't look at it as this channel versus this channel it's this channel versus fortnite versus tiktok versus uh, you know social media social media so remember everything competes with everything and we found that they both overgeneralize and overnarrow the term public service media quite a bit, listing pretty much all of their social media and their game platforms, but not channels four and five, interestingly. None included YouTube, which we found very interesting, though you'll see later that, that it does fit several of their criteria for what makes public service media. When we switched it up and prompted them with a a list of names of several public service media brands, we asked them to sort those brands and say, which of these do you believe are public service media and which do you do you not? In uh, in fact, they captured most of the major services. They were correct on most of the major services, but they really struggled for consistency when they when they got even within umbrellas like uh, like BBC and ITV. If you got to the sub brands there, they, they struggled a little more to identify. When we asked what defines public service media, the kids generated kind of a a mix of fact and fiction. They correctly viewed it as free to receive, and they knew that it was meant to serve everybody. But some thought that it didn't include online services at all. So I'm not sure why then they included Roblox, Fortnite, and TikTok in the unprompted. And others said that it had to be government uh, government owned, not just government uh, supported or or government endorsed, but uh, or, or government. Uh, it's indirectly underwritten, but but government owned. They were kind of all over the map with how it's paid for. Some correctly noted the license fee and advertising, but they also guessed at direct government funding and subscription fees or donations. The success of Bite Size during lockdown is is already very well known. We first tracked uh, BBC. We first tracked Bite Size Daily in October 2020, and by October 2021, its use had jumped by 86 percent. Uh, its use in the last week of April 2021 was 30 percent of of, you, of the children that, that we surveyed had used Bite Size sometime in that previous week. But kids were somewhat ambivalent about why they used it and when they used it. Uh, from these quotes, some loved it and some felt that they only used it out of requirement my favorite being the kid who said my mother my mom made me so i just want to close with three quick perspectives on public service media and media literacy strengthening uk content delivery is part of the solution but helping young people understand and uh, trust and responsibility those two foundational principles of public service media uh, as as hallmarks is is really critical our group's responses suggest that they believe if they pay for a platform if they pay for content well, it must be reliable because I'm paying for it. Otherwise, I wouldn't. That Google content is all previously vetted, that you can believe everything you see on Google, and that platforms of their generation are also the voices of their generation. So that TikTok uh, and, and things like that are the reliable voices of their generation. The challenge isn't just who's trustworthy, but what makes it trustworthy. So understanding editorial insight and the difference between reactive moderation and editorial insight oversight is is kind of spotty among them, especially as we move toward, as I previously mentioned, the metaverse with so many platforms and services existing in a converging and sort of easy to navigate space. The unique differences and purposes for public service media will have to be made even more clear. And then finally, where do kids see the future of public media? 
other than a few throwbacks who are eager for letters, face-to-face conversations, and uh, getting their information from the pub, the kids that we spoke to were actually pretty conventional in terms of what they want for themselves and their future children. Google, Alexa, news apps, the BBC, they believe all will remain central to the, where they get news and information. And aside from not surprisingly wanting everything to be free, they want their kids to have more of the opportunities that they have, the same opportunities, only more so. This has been a really quick dash. If you want the slides or or have questions, please feel free to contact me and I'll be in the follow-up later. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I'm going to come back to you for questions when I go to the group discussions because I'm just going to move things on and um and bring emma scott in now uh emma uh can you give us your your contribution yeah hello lovely to be here shame we're not in sheffield but next year um up front i want to say i really do believe in public service media in all its forms um i believe it's essential to supporting the uk shared national identity our culture our democracy and that's particularly the case for children's content from my past work I understand the regulated world with the PSBs, the advantages, the difficulties that brings, but I've also been part of the revolution in kids' content where children have been resoundingly voting with their eyeballs, wanting to experience something different and in different places. So my argument today is twofold. Public service media for children is essential, but how it works has to change and quickly, both from a content as well as a discovery point of view. And the regulatory framework needs to change to ensure children are better protected whilst enjoying the things they love watching. So does public service media still have an important role to play? Yes. And even more so when it comes to children's media where technological change is outstripping content evolution. We know the UK hugely values and recognises the benefits of public service media for kids, whether it's milkshake and CBeebies in the early years or the ongoing wonder of a BBC bite size for secondary school children. However, the performance of children's services has been waning for some years and a significant gap emerged almost a decade ago, particularly for children over six, where the drop's been even higher. What started as a drop in ratings, which we saw from David's slides, is now a torrent of existential, structural, technological and behavioural change across the world of children's media and because the commercial broadcasters are struggling too. I don't have a silver bullet, but I do have a headline. For the UK's highly valuable PSB ecology to survive, there needs to be a radical new approach to collaboration. The change needs to happen across content and discovery. Is the type and balance of content right? And where and how should should, should children be consuming? In terms of content, are we producing the right types to meet the needs of the audience? Has the world changed so significantly that we should challenge our preconceived notions of how that relates to national identity and culture? There is a bit of a tendency in the kids industry to say children don't know what they want until they've seen it and that fads and phases come and go. But YouTube, Netflix and even TikTok are here to stay. The Young Audiences Content Fund was brought in to seek to redress the market inefficiencies of the children's. But I wonder if the fund, if it were to continue in some form, might an important focus be on truly understanding what children want alongside rethinking the nature of public service media. This is not about trying to shoehorn Tracy Beaker into a TikTok feed. It's about developing truly authentic, new and exciting ways to storytell and inform a uniquely digitally adept audience. So moving on to the best environment to support children. Well, the world we live in now is not the 2003 when Ofcom last dealt with structural change. For the commercial broadcasters, we hear that children's can be too restrictive, costly and an obligation too far, perhaps. Separately for the BBC, Children's is one of the crown jewels, highly important in licence fee negotiations, which means that wider public service media collaboration might not be as high up their agenda as it could be. So what's the best environment? Well, we heard Ed Vasey speaking and he's written about a world of working with the fangs to encourage the discovery of public service media content and regulating more evenly to level the playing field. I think all of these options deserve consideration and radical thinking. Do we need a unified digital first streaming service or platform for children's across the PSBs? It feels 10 years out of date to even suggest it, not least because I proposed it when I ran Freesat. But still worth returning to, and the pure commercial kids broadcasters might want to join too, with shock horror an optional subscription fee. Or could syndication be part of the answer, Netflix, Sky or YouTube having public service media devoted areas? 
or working with Google to identify and deliver public service media focused search results first based on trending topics for kids and then taking children to safe places with a variety of types of content and recommendations. Without doubt, all of these options have consequences for the pub public service broadcasters about control, brand, reputation, loyalty, and so on. But they shouldn't be disregarded when the alternative we face could be a rapidly depleting audience who could depart the PSB's age five and potentially not return until they're 55. As the former Children's Commissioner Anne Longfield said recently, if you want to engage, you have to go where they are. My position is simple. Please, can we get a serious move on with finding solutions? We've known about these issues for a long time now, and now is the time to act. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, can I now ask Jaffet to uh, for his contribution, please? Jaffet Asher. Sure. Um, uh, as uh, I, I feel like Jack Grealish being brought on as a substitute, so um, my thoughts are not as detailed as some of the others, um, but uh, let me uh, give you my thoughts this morning about how important it is for kids to have various media touch points. Um, as I've been attending sessions this week at CMC, I've been thinking about the phrase, you are what you eat. Um, the original version of this phrase was from a 19th century French lawyer, and he actually said, tell me what you eat and I will tell you who you are. Uh, he was making a comment about class, how rich was your diet, what could you afford to eat, and about national characteristics, where could your ingredients grow, um, the food you eat being connected to the soil it grows in. It was a clever construct. Of course, our lawyer hadn't heard of Google, tell me what you search and I will tell you who you are. But what about media cons consumption? Does that tell us who we are or is it the other way round? In every session, I've heard commissioners saying they're looking for content that reflects kids' lives here in Britain and is made by diverse British voices. In the end, public service media is all about national and individual identity, and that matters more than ever. In my piece for the Children's Media Foundation report, I talk about the lean-in generation we've been raising, proactive, activist, gamified, used to be interacting with media and each other in both digital and physical spaces. I propose that we let our audience in on our commissioning choices, making them advocates for their favorite characters, genres, and ideas. Our audience trust us, and we need to trust them. It's this relationship with our audience, particularly our kids' audience, that justifies our future. I think any debate about the future of public service media also needs to take into account not just the reality we're currently confronting of the market dominance of US streamers, but really also considering what's coming next. Um, as Emma said, I'm not sure that the debate we've been having for the last 10 years is almost still relevant. We need to move on. Real-time 3D engines like Unity and Unreal are changing the way we make linear video and virtual spaces. Advanced artificial intelligence is capable not just of running algorithms, but also generating personalized iterations of content. And a new wave of computing that will move us on from mobile connected devices that allow us to access a content when and where we choose to contextual computing in which physical spaces, objects and people all have their digital doppelganger. We're painting the physical world with data and that data will drive increasingly personalized content based on where you are and what you are doing as well as who you are with. We variously call this digital context a metaverse world. The name's not really important. What does matter is that we recognize how radically this wave of change will impact content. For decades, we've repeated the concept that content is king. This has never been entirely true, um, as content is a prisoner of context. Context changes content. A can of soup in the kitchen is to be eaten. In a gallery, it's to be admired. So let's say that if content is king, context is queen. Constant dialectic, one affecting the other. But the balance is about to shift. It's time for queen context to rule. Well, public service media is all about context. I think of context as the kitchen and content types are the ingredients for feeding and nurturing our digital identities. There's always room for all you can eat buffet of content in our lives 
But there's also a kitchen where we meet, talk and make food together, making choices together. It's where our identities are forged. And so do we want the algorithm to set the menu or do we want public service media in the kitchen? That's my argument. Thank you, Jaffa. So already two stimulating contributions, uh, personalization versus broadcasting, context versus content, the role of children uh, of the audience in content selection and uh, development. And um, are there ways in which we could create unified spaces um, on the platforms in order to showcase the best of what we've got? Um, so keep the questions coming in um, while I hand on to our, our last speaker, Jenny Buckland, who's joining us from Australia. Jenny. Hi, um, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. This is a great conference that I've been lucky enough to attend a few times in person, um, back when in the days when we were able to do that. And I've always loved it because of the policy element, I, which I don't think you get anywhere else. I think the first time I was at CMC, this is going to reveal how old I am, but I think it was back in um, 2003 or 2004 when the obligations um, on the PSPs, uh, commercial PSPs, had been removed. And there was a huge debate at CMC about what this meant for the future. Everyone was incredibly worried about children's commissions um, on the PS, commercial PSPs falling off a cliff, uh, which I believe they uh, did. Um, and you were all aghast at the, the fact that you might just be left with the BBC to pitch to. As an Australian at that time sitting in the audience, this was an epiphany moment for me. Because you see the ABC, which is our equivalent of the BBC, except that it's funded directly by government rather than a licence fee, has no mandate to commission any levels of children's local content. And back in 2004, most of its children's content was ordered mostly from you. Um, they commissioned a measly seven to 13 hours of children's drama, local children's drama a year, um, for example, whereas the three commercial broadcasters in Australia were required uh, to commission 32 hours of first release Australian children's drama a year. And on top of that, they had a whole lot of other obligations to do preschool and non-drama content for children. So at CMC in 2004, I was watching your distress and thinking, well, at least you've got the BBC because it's got two channels. It's got, um, by our standards, a very big budget and they're commissioning lots and lots of local content, lots, lots of British content. And if the commercial broadcast in Australia were ever going to manage to get the children's obligations dropped, which I assumed they would because they'd been whinging about them forever, I thought, well, we're not going to be left with very much at all um, in Australia. So off the back of that epiphany, we, I came home and we started a campaign for the ABC to be given additional money to establish its children's channels. And it took until 2009 for that to be achieved. So sometimes you can have the idea, but if it takes forever to emerge, it might, have, might be an old idea by the time it comes to fruition. Um, and it wasn't until 2020, which is last year, um, that in fact the Australian broadcasters finally won their battle to have their obligations to do children's content dropped, which I think is about three years after um, the UK Parliament and Ofcom started reconsidering the whole idea of letting the commercial PSBs in the UK off the hook. Um, but I just wanted to share some of the things that I've learned coming out of all this and where I think uh, we might be going and some principles we need to establish. When the ABC got that extra funding from government and established its children's channels, the results initially were incredibly transformative. Children's doing children's television for the ABC suddenly became a very sexy thing and lots of very established adult um, producers or producers who hadn't done work in the children's space got involved. It became incredibly competitive and uh, some of the old old timers missed out on commissions. But I think it was a, a fantastic thing to at that point see that the quality and the quantity of the content of the content for the ABC just climbed to new levels. The children's audience discovered that distinctive new content on the ABC. They voted with their feet and ABC audience share increased substantially. And at the same time, the audience for the children 
children's content on the commercial channels declined um, really in quite dramatically. It was difficult to find. It wasn't promoted. And it just, once you had an active, vibrant ABC, it just didn't stand up. So then the commercial channels spending on children's content dropped to incredibly low levels. They had to do the same amount of content, but producers who were happy to accept really low licence fees and a minority position in an international animated co-production, um, which neither looked nor sounded Australian, won most of the commercial TV commissions. And the children's audience weren't watching those shows. So when it came to the last few years in a campaign um, uh, to maintain those quotas on commercial channels needed to be mounted. It was very hard to defend them because where were the Australian shows, the well-loved Australian shows on commercial TV? There were one or two, but there weren't. The community wasn't particularly going to miss them if they were scrapped. Meanwhile, over at the ABC, inside the broadcaster, when they got all of that extra money for children's content in 2009, there were others inside the ABC who didn't work in children's who decided that the children's audience were being over-serviced by all that new content. So quite a lot of that additional money that we and the um, others had fought so hard for them to have got redirected to other areas of the ABC. And yes, we did also have a conservative government come along and cut ABC funding but before they did that, the ABC itself had started to help itself to the kids' budget. They hate me pointing that out, by the way. I mean, that's because they got the money, but they didn't get any specific obligations with that. Um, it was though it was a press release, here's some money to establish children's channels and actually uh, no, um, no agreement or arrangement with the taxpayer. So the amount of kids' content that the ABC commissions now is variable, depending on how much money the children's department can get its hands on in any one year. And of course, for all the reasons that the other two speakers and David um, have spoken about, the, the, um, its share of the kids' audience has come down anyway um, from the, those height, that years of that height, because of all the choice and competition for children's time and all eyeballs via YouTube, YouTube, TikTok streamers, gaming and everywhere else. But the ABC still does find that it's the local shows, especially the ones that can't be seen anywhere else, um, that do the best for them. The kids aren't necessarily finding them on linear channels. They're finding them on iView, which is our version of iPlayer. And um, I think 60% of the viewing of um, the ABC's iView channel is actually of uh, kids' content, not something you'll hear anyone in the ABC outside of the children's department um, actually uh, own up to. But with the obligations on the commercial channels now gone, the ABC is in close to a monopoly position. And that's really bad, obviously, for producers who are unable to get a commission at the ABC. And it's not great as far as deal terms are concerned. And competition is vital. And more importantly, the kids are engaging with other platforms. So we have to find ways to get kids content on commercial platforms, including the streamers. The Australian government's got a green paper out at the moment um, where they're looking at whether Australian content obligations should actually be imposed on the ABC, but also whether there should be some kind of quota or expenditure obligation on the streamers and other commercial platforms. And they're looking really closely at what's going on in the rest of the world, particularly in Canada, Europe, uh, the UK, um, and what everybody else is doing in that space. But guess what? The children's audience isn't even mentioned in that green paper. I gather that's sort of the kind of thing that's happening here in the UK too, which is why CM, the Children's Media Foundation have published uh, their discussion papers. But in case that all sounds really negative, there are some things that I feel really positive about. The content that streamers are after tends to be high-end quality content. They do actually offer really genuine competition to the public broadcasters who are also after quality content. So I think we absolutely have to avoid a situation where we impose obligations that just result in space filling content that children don't want to watch. But we do need to look 
at what we do to encourage or require those streamers to invest in local content in our own countries. And I think it's got to be a combination, I suppose, of carrot and stick. In, and in years past, if you wanted your show to be sold internationally, then there was a sense that you had to internationalise it. You know, I gather that it was impossible for the Americans to understand the Beatrix Potter tales or Winnie the Pooh unless they were dubbed uh, into American English and that um, if PBS were going to screen Degrassi High, the kids needed to exchange greenbacks rather than Canadian dollars. But I think all of that's changed. The current generation of streamers are buying content that's very distinctive in the country of origin because they need to build subscribers there. And then those shows are being watched by global audiences. So Disney let uh, Bluey go on worldwide uh, with their Australian accents, for example, certainly in America and the UK with their Australian accents. So at the AC and at the ACTF, we used to feel that the whole world wanted every show we brought them to them to be set on the beach with blonde kids in bikinis, but we um, and that international buyers would be troubled by really minor details like the fact that kids were wearing sun hats in the playground and they didn't think that'd be relatable in uh, Germany in the winter. But these days, we find that international buyers are much more. Um, uh, au fait or interested in strange accents or shows that are set in Western Sydney with a much more diverse cast or in a remote uh, Indigenous community in Australia. And universally, we all seem to be striving to do a better job about representation on screen and doing uh, very distinctive, special things that speak to the children uh, in our own communities. So the shows that we make and that you make for our distinctive local audiences are also finding places on international services. It's just that no one wants to fully fund them and that they won't get made unless we have the funds and the tax incentives are set right in our own countries. In my experience over all that uh, time since 2003, I felt that every cent spent on children's screen content seems to be resented by other sections of the industry. Whether that's within the broadcasters themselves, inside funding bodies, everyone else always has their eyes on it. And then we also need to continually campaign to remind everyone that just putting a local content quota or expenditure obligation or some kind of tax on a service doesn't guarantee that any of that content will be children's content. Content for the children's audience needs to be specifically carved out or acquired or it won't happen. And there need to be special funds like your young audience's content fund that are specifically for children's content. And I think they should be able to fund content uh, on all of those international platforms that, that uh, children in the UK access. The key, I think, is asking our governments to properly value local content for children and to recognise the really vital role it plays in building happy, strong, kind, confident children and cohesive, caring communities. And I think we've got so much to learn from each other in how we do this. Thanks. Jenny, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for, the, for the view from abroad, but also in some ways, you're ahead of us in some of these debates, so the view from ahead. Okay, we're going to move into our um, uh, debate. Before we move into the debate, I just want to remind you of the three voting questions. Um, I, I think you probably see them in your side screen. I'm not going to read them out. You can all read. At the end of this session, please vote on each question whether you agree or disagree. The golden age of kids' television, uh, a cultural tax, and that uh, public service media has to be available in all the places, including non-PSB platforms. So you, you can read the questions. Please um, vote before the end of the session whether you agree or disagree with each of those questions. But now I'm going to pull the panel together and start the discussion. And I'm going to start with a cheeky question, um, which is from, I can't see who the question is from, but the question is as follows. Uh, Industries are like property developers who heavily donate to the Conservative Party to get favourable policies. Uh, the question says, how much should children's media donate to the Conservatives to get preferential treatment? And what's the best way to funnel those funds? I'm going to tweak it slightly and just say, 
what do we need to do to make this sector attractive to the government in power? Anybody want to go first? Yafet? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm not so sure it's about what we give them, but what we take away. I'd recommend that we withdraw CBBS for a week and prompt a storming of parliament by uh, <laughs> uh, agitated parents. I think that might uh, get their attention. <laughs> Having done homeschooling, I'd certainly be there. Emma, any thoughts? <laughs> How do we make oh, this I agree with that. To the I think, I think <laughs> until you take it away, you don't know what you're missing. But it has to become a priority for government, and uh, it hasn't been for for a while. And I think we're all saying how do we do thing, that? Really. Do we do we do that by dressing it up in Britishness, which is a current fixation, or do we set everything in the red wall seats, which is another fixation? Um, how do we do that? How do we make it matter? I think it's for, for this government, it's probably about national identity and about culture and about um, harmonising and about a future for kids, but also the mental health crisis that we've got on our hands following the pandemic, you know, um, for sort of all ages of kids and uh, um, teenagers as well. So there's got to be a lot of money put into a lot of services to do with children. And I think um, public service media is kind of high up that list. You know, we keep hearing about levelling up, don't we? Um, and it seems like this is an crazy time to cut the funding of public service media, cut the funding of the BBC, cut the funding to the uh, 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 content fund, uh, privatise Channel 4, um, just at the moment that we need them most um, to uh, continue with the process of enhancing digital literacy, reinforcing our sense of national identity, and um, supporting our kids in this amazing transition to this much more complex uh, media landscape. Um, it's, it, and so somehow that argument needs to be made, I think both in emotional terms, as well as in uh, really strong um, arguments that Jenny and Emma have both presented, I think, yeah. I, th I think you'll find a lot of support for the bite-sized type activity it's the it's the entertainment and that the, the kids want entertainment that speaks to them jenny how did you were you able to make that case in australia we have often the actf has an has a really amazing board actually that aren't all industry people and i think i think it is about i mean the argument emma made about mental health is really significant the contribution that uh, distinct local children's content makes uh, to an educational um, experience and social cohesion, um, accessibility. I think all of those things, it's really important for the industry to argue, but the industry can be seen to be self-serving. So it's very important to actually have powerful advocates who can speak to those emotional stories, but who don't appear to have any skin in the game other than this is a really important issue. Jenny, mm. I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to talk about the streamers and the OTTs. Um, I mean, Australia is one of the few countries that's actually taken them on. Um, have you seen any change as a result of the government taking on Facebook and others? Uh, what they yes, what what appears to happen if the government stands up to them is that they they sit down and come to the table and negotiate. Uh, so um, the the Australian government did take though you're quite correct. Facebook and Google up around news content, and and now they're looking at that question of. Uh, con some kind of content obligation or expenditure obligation for local Australian content. They haven't done it. They've put the discussion paper out there and you can imagine that Netflix and Amazon and Disney and everyone else have put in a submission suggesting that's not a great thing to do and that they're all um, just falling over themselves to commission Australian content without having to do that. And of course they are at the moment, but and there's a very big incentive for them to do that whilst government is threatening something um, for them to actually invest in Australian content. And we're quite a good place to produce at the moment because we don't have a lot of um, COVID uh, or we have very low cases. So it's quite a, considered quite a safe space to be. So Australian producers are finding they're getting quite a lot of commissions. But um, the, the issue that we keep pushing with government 
around that issue is that everyone in the world is is looking at it is looking at doing that and if it's just if you just take it on face value then you won't necessarily know that um, they'll continue to do that but there does seem to be um, perhaps and perhaps it's because they're international and not the local commercial broadcasters there actually seems to be more of an appetite to regulate the international streamers or to require them to do something than there are for the commercial broadcasters who are struggling and, and they're concerned they'll fall over. Emma and Jaffa mm -hmm. could that work here or what should we be asking for from the streamers? Emma, you talked about uh, algorithmic change. I think the streamers, you know, put their march, you know, into the market, haven't they? And I think they also do produce public service type content as well. I think making them a big part of the ecology and um, maybe levies, I'm not sure I agree with them, but being part of the solution um, is should definitely be put on their plates. Same with taxation and where, where they're all located as well. Um, I think it's, it's difficult though because public service media for kids has always been sort of put in this sort of separate bubble and the commercial world sort of carries on and it's it's quite tough but i do think when it comes to google where you know kids are searching for content and i found that at Vino studios you know that's where we really manage to gain the algorithm so to to push out content really high up but there, there's work to be done with the, with the search engines i think in particular and Jaffet. Well, you know, look, I think the issue of the algorithms and how content is discovered is a huge part of the issue. Um, you know, uh, for all of the volume of content that exists in a Netflix, for example, it is within that silo. Um, increasingly, um, as we move into this world of contextual computing, what's going to matter is how what content gets delivered to you at a particular moment. And if it, we're looking to try to create safe spaces for kids, safe public spaces for kids, making sure that the AI that is connecting the dots has a public service element to it um, is critical. It's not that important anymore whether we're at the top of the EPG or even what, what order the apps are in on the smart set. What matters is the algorithm and the AI and how we make sure that there's a role for public service or legislation to protect public service um, and surface it in that context, in my view. So there is a question which has come in, which uh, it says basically, should the iPlayer be opened up to all PSBs uh, so that there's one place for them to go? Now we take that question just to expand it. Maybe it's not the iPlayer, but should all of kids PSB content be in one place? Is that a desirable outcome, and is that possible? Uh, who, yeah. Anybody? Can go. Emma, that was in your. That was in your. your you talked your about remark. it, Emma. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, in a world where the BBC dominates the content, that's the complication. But the commercial broadcasters, and and let's also say non non um, PSB content, I think there would be appetite for it because. If you're trying to compete with Netflix and Google and and Facebook, or not Facebook, YouTube for for kids, it's they're mammoth and we're tiny in comparison. So in a world of that kind of um, you know spreading out of content, we've got to consolidate. Uh, we're we're too small. So it's it's acting together now and pooling that content. Mm. And Jaffa, I'm going to come to you. I'm just going to remind people, please vote in the voting app uh, so we can see your votes. Jaffa. Well, I just, you know, it's a frustrating question because I, when I, I was at the BBC when we did Project K Kangaroo um, and there was a move to bring together um, UK public service media in what was already beginning to exist as iPlayer. And, of course, the government stopped it. I feel like we're having a conversation that's 10 years old um, and that ship has sailed. Um, so we need to move beyond thinking about the players and think more about um, uh, this issue of um, AI and algorithm. It really is the issue, not is everything in a silo together, because that's just creating another silo. Either you're interested in going there or not, whereas what we want is for the offer to come to you when you are ready for it without having to go into that particular room, that particular app, that particular box. And I think that's what matters right now. So two fundamentally like different ideas there. One is pull it all together in one space and you go. And I guess that, that definitely speaks to parents. 
And then there's another idea, which is wh however you search, it comes to you, uh, which is speaking, I, I guess, more directly to the audience because they're the ones who are searching. Yeah, but, but, you know, yeah you can do both. And I think also because you need the content to be there when people choose to go and find it, as well as having it come and be offered to them. And I think, you know, we... we and we're all about the idea of identity. I I know I would trust public service media much more with the identity, my own identity, the identity of my kids, and um, and the data that accumulates around that, um, and would be willing to make a trade off to receive that um, that context for my content in a way that bluntly I just wouldn't. And I'm always madly hitting all the privacy buttons on everything that I do in a broader uh, internet context. So, you know, I, um, I think that's something which we also need to fundamentally address and there's a role for public service media in that. I'm gonna ask a final question, I'm gonna ask it of all of you. Um, we're talking about mass personalization and we're talking about public broadcasting at the same time how do we manage this duality of we're talking public service media but the experiences are increasingly private the the, the experiences are increasingly personalized how do we manage that contradiction <laughs> for, for children there's so there's so many privacy rules gdpr and copper rules about what you can and can't do so that's going to have to be looked at because the children are going to want um you know ideas for them as well as this idea of mass media and that sort of serendipity around it but at the moment it's it's very very restrictive um and you know jeff it's talking about you know quite rightly all well, the boxes we tick to to not um have things pushed at us but there's a balance to be struck um somewhere in the middle because having no personalization is not going to um work longer term but it's how it's done yeah so giving uh, giving parents and children greater control over how they personalize content is probably the answer to that and in fact more than that i think the kids that have grown up over the last 10 years expect it um they uh, personalize their content they personalize um, all kinds of aspects of their lives with the brands and stories that they care about and they share them and we know this. So what we need to do is make sure that there is an approach to that that reflects public service values and um, and actually that's a basis for a long-term relationship with those kids. Jenny, final yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I, look, I, I don't think we can get away from personalization, but it, it is that balance. I mean, it's the same, I guess, that we all find now with Facebook's on algorithm, you know, algorithms on Facebook or anything else or Google, where they're sending you only what they think you want to watch. And that's how we're all ending mm. up in these bubbles and in such conflict with each other, because we only realize that we're only seeing what we want to watch and we don't understand something different. So you have to come up with some kind of balance where you're actually in introducing uh, children and the audience and their parents to other stuff that they mightn't have even known they wanted. But we definitely have to find a way um, to make it easy and enjoyable for them to find all of the public service content that's there and that might be relevant to them. I'm just okay. grinning because I'm thinking I only get to watch what my wife wants to watch because she uses my YouTube account all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we, we've run over slightly, and uh, but um, some incredible contributions. So I want to thank Emma, uh, Jaffet and Jenny. I also want to thank David for his presentation. And David is going to be available to talk to in the Wonder session uh, immediately after here. Um, the votes are coming in but the vote is going to remain open for a little while yet currently it looks like the majority disagree with number one but agree with numbers two and three but that vote will stay open for a little while yet um so over to wanda to continue this conversation and to argue about the results um it feels a bit like brexit day all over again um, you can download your free CMF report for much more on this uh, subject. And if you can, please support CMF by becoming a supporter or patron. CMF needs all the help they can get at the beginning of what is going to be a very, very long campaign. 
Uh, next up here with a sense of irony in the scheduling is the commissioner conversation with the on-demand streamers. Um, that come in at 2 p.m. But please uh, go over to the Wonder Session uh, if you want to continue this conversation. I'd just like to thank all of our guests and um, wish everybody a great rest of the conference. Thank you.